going to say a couple of things now about hospice, and I'm not saying it in any sense as a criticism. It's just a, a gross oversimplification and a generalization, but most hospice work is done with the viewpoint that dying is really the ultimate catastrophe. Let's make the best of a bad situation. Let's deal with the psychological things, the physical pain, as skillfully, lovingly, and openly as possible. But there's still a very strong underlying implication, often at least, that it's really a damn shame that you have to die and, you know, we'll try and make the best of it. What we're saying is, for lack of a better word, the spiritual statement about death, that who you are, who I am, is really almost a twofold process. We're human beings that have bodies, that have personality structures, that are going to die, that are going to come to an end sooner or later. And that, to be sure, we have to deal with the emotional, psychological, physical issues that arise when someone is dying. There is a lot of grief, there's confusion, there's fear. All these things are very real. They come up again and again. But still keeping that human quality in mind, on the other side, there is the spiritual truth that there is something in us that transcends that. There is a vastness that we are all contained within that doesn't die. And that if, in fact, one sees this physical plane as a spiritual school, as a place where we have all come to go through our lessons, whether it's a difficult marriage or whether it's getting a, a terminal illness, or whether it's stubbing your toe or stepping on one of those cute little goat heads out in the field, that the way we relate to these experiences is over and over again showing us very directly, in a way that's quite perfect, the places that we are caught. So that, in fact, the dying experience, seen from that perspective, and keeping in mind that, yes, those human issues are still there and a great deal of warmth and caring are also needed, but that it can be potentially one of the most productive opening experiences in one's life. I remember about two months ago I was writing a grant proposal and as I was rereading it after I had written it, it said there was this phrase, the wonderful opportunity that dying presents. And I thought of the people that might be reading this grant proposal and I realized that I should maybe sort of uh, rewrite it in a way that sounded not quite so strange. But in fact, I fully believe that because to the extent that you or I consider ourselves a separate human being, to that extent we're afraid to die, to that extent we're not enlightened. So there's a, really a perfect mirror that is showing us our separateness. And all the other fears we have, the fear to love and the fear to stand up in a tall building and all the things you might want to go to a psychoanalyst for, in some sense, down beneath all that stuff is holding to life, attachment to separateness. At the Dying Center, we're doing essentially three things at the same time. First and most obviously, we are taking care of sick people. People come there often in the last stages of cancer, live there for a few months, and often die. In the beginning of our work, most of the people got better and left, and all my friends were kidding me, saying, I thought this was the dying center. <laughs> uh, Mother Teresa talks about that in India, people are starving to death, people are dying on the streets. And in the West, there are, certainly there are people starving to death, but not too many. And what she says is that in the West, people are starving for love. 
So our work there is, to be sure, nursing and cooking and bathing and changing diapers. And I can tell you some very funny stories about things that have happened there, and maybe we'll have time to do that. But uh, beyond all that, to just be in an environment in which, even though someone is dying, to be fully loved is quite a blessing. Many of the people who have come to be with us have not been the person that I fantasized as we were starting up. This sort of new age person who had been meditating for several years and was now dying of cancer and we would meditate together and they would die and the angels would play their trumpets and the harps would be going very softly in the background and everybody would be crying and it would be so lovely. That uh, because probably because we're in northern New Mexico there is not really a, a hotbed of New Age thought and a lot of our customers have been coming from the surrounding area. So that there have been artists and American Indians and just very ordinary kinds of folks, but all of them with a real willingness to work on themselves. And I've been seeing that even though sometimes I don't have the opportunity to talk about some of the meditative practices that we've been doing here, or tomorrow, for instance, Stephen's going to lead some pain meditations, working with pain in a meditative kind of way, that we haven't had too much opportunity to do those things, that just me being with these people who are dying and there being an environment where I'm not so caught in you're dying, it's really awful, has been incredibly useful for both of us. That just being in an environment where I can see you as a human being rather than you're somebody who's dying, you're somebody who has lymphoma or you're somebody who has leukemia or you're somebody who has cancer in your liver, they just see you as a human being and for sure your body is going through these changes that are often painful and messy and everything else. But there we are and we're all in this thing kind of together. Originally, when we were trying to figure out how, let me backtrack just a second. We don't charge people for coming to the dying center. There's no, no charge at all for our services, for the food, for the utilities, for living there. We just ask that people have enough money to pay for their own medical expenses. And if they don't have that, then generally the government pays for it in one form or another anyway. So originally, I was kind of wondering, how can we keep from emptying out all the convalescent hospitals? Since here's a beautiful place, loving staff, free of charge. Maybe if you have two spiritual names and you've met, been meditating for five years and you've been to India twice, then you can come to the dining center. But any kind of prerequisite, spiritual or whatever they might be, seemed really both elitist and at the same time probably self-defeating in the sense that I've met many people who have had a very ordinary sort of a life in terms of spiritual practice, housewife, accountant, whatever they might be, and through six months of dealing with their cancer have done more opening up than many people might do in ten years at a Zen center. So that it would, it would seem to be very difficult to find some kind of a prerequisite. And what kind of came out of that exploration was that the only prerequisite for being in the dying center didn't have anything to do with the past but it had to do with a willingness in the present to explore the truth. And very quickly we found out that that didn't have just to do with those people we call patients but those of us who are on the staff. That all of us had to be willing to live in an environment that at times is pretty intense. It isn't like at five o'clock you get to go home because you're home all day. And when someone comes close to death, oftentimes it's a 24-hour day job. Uh, so consequently, and the other thing I've noticed is that even people on the staff have typically gone through changes that have been just as transformative psychologically as the people who are dying. So that everybody really has to have that commitment. The other thing is that I don't promise that when someone 
comes that they're going to be able to stay. One lady came. She said, I want to come to the dying center for 40 days and do a retreat so that I can heal myself. I, she had cancer that was breast cancer metastasized to her liver. And uh, she had the feeling that if she could just understand something a little more deeply in her psychodynamics, that that understanding would lead to her healing. So she wanted to come to some very protected place and be there for 40 days. And I said, I can't promise you that, I'll, that it's going to be okay to stay for 40 days. It's, a, it's an hour-to-hour -hour contract. And she said, well, I really can't live with that because I'm dying, or I might be dying, I'm very weak. I need to be protected right now. And it ended up that I didn't budge and she came, and she actually stayed for 50 days and died. A lot of the work we're doing there is finding out what compassion is. Is it giving people what they want? Or are we really trying to create an environment in which the implicit contract is, in each moment, getting to what it is that's keeping us from being fully together in that space.